coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. I primarily focus on the invertebrates, little small critters. You might think of some alien creatures, pretty much right on the head. During Cowboy Camp, we went around to show them what it takes to uh, operate the ranches and the hunting operation. You need to have some family time. Yep. And that's what I'm doing right now. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. Have you ever really looked at a creek, stream, or river? I mean, really looked up close, down at the bottom. This guy does that for a living. Meet Dr. Arches Grubb, an aquatic invertebrate biologist. Invertebrates are really great indicators of water quality because the water quality is going down. Those are the first ones to disappear from the water. His name is Dr. Grubb, and this bug dude studies the health of Texas rivers by checking in on the tiny invertebrates that live here. Beautiful. I don't have a bottle, let me see if I can catch him for you. <laughs> There's a damselfly larva, and it's super small. Oh, this one's a caterpillar, green one. <laughs> I primarily focus on the invertebrates, little small critters. Look at the black and yellow on it, love it. Just beautiful creatures underwater. You might think of some alien creatures, pretty much right on the head. This is the Blanco River. And it's Dr. Grubb's latest study site. It's very important because I'm studying and finding out what all the diversity of these invertebrates are. And so I am capturing a snapshot here and recording what all we find. I'm only getting 0.98 CFS. We are measuring water quality now, which includes temperature, conductivity, which is the salinity of the water, um, how much oxygen's in the water. I really like this site. It just has a lot of different components to it. So it's got big pools where a lot of the water's flowing up and the water's deeper. Then it's got riffles that are shallow with a lot of cobble and a lot of stones. Bugs like a lot of things to hold on to, so a lot of debris and vegetation. Um, they really love that kind of stuff. So this is just a great site for that. There we go. You're gonna find tons of these bugs. Most of them are uh, the nymph stage or the larval stage. See those case builders right here? Mm -hmm. There's a whole bunch of them here. Oh wow, look at this. There's a stonefly. Yes. Ooh. Look at that. That's the biggest hellgrammite for today. Oh my gosh. You see it? Very cool. These two are here because of the floods of 2015. Good evening from Central Texas, the scene of utter devastation, a natural disaster of epic proportions. These flood levels were really huge. Uh, it was a 500 year flood event. Regular discharge on the Blanco River is about 90 CFS, which is cubic feet per second. And it peaked around 150,000 CFS. Um, it came out of its banks, all the vegetation, took down giant 100-year cypress trees. A lot of debris came through the system and scrubbed the substrate clean. The floods wiped out almost 90% of the aquatic invertebrates. Ooh, yeah. So for the next several months, these two will check six different sites along the Blanco River. We collect three samples, just dump all whatever we have. There's going to be tons of insects packed in it. So now that flows are back down to where they're normal level, 
Uh, we want to see how the bug population is re-establishing itself. Which ones were most affected and uh, how they're doing now? While the invertebrates make their way back to the lab, Dr. Grubb gets a break at the house. Hey, Bucky. How y'all doing? Sort of. This is Tibbles. He's Pearl's rat. It's a bit hectic on the home front. I really like the bears because they have like a really beautiful color. He has a little heart on his back, if you can see. I haven't named this tiger Barb yet. And then he runs, he runs over here. <laughs> it's kind of like the wild kingdom here, with plenty of fish. This is a 250 gallon tank. These are some Roseline sharks. These are from India. Uh, then we got some uh, clown loaches over here. These are from Indonesia. My husband lives, breathes, dreams, fish. Yeah, this is my planet aquarium. It's a 65 gallon tank. I got the whole thing set up natural with live plants. When we got married and lived together is when I noticed he was starting to do all these setups in our little itty bitty apartment. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. I didn't know that it'd last, and eventually the little 10 gallons were, would evolve to eight footers, and I'm just like, okay, this is a little extreme. <laughs> they say never take your work home with you. So I really like the blue in this Cardinal Tetris light up really nicely. But for arches, it seems like the opposite is true. Yeah, I mean, you gotta do what you love, right? So it's good. See how it goes. Really enjoying this every day when I come home from work. I just sit here, chill out, take a break instead of turning on the TV. I just enjoy watching this. This is one of the hardest parts. So these are some of the bugs we just collected from the Blanco River. This part typically takes quite a lot of time because uh, you have to look through the bugs, different parts of their bodies, uh, legs, the claws, the mouth parts, to figure out which one they are and go through the ski and shows you what you're looking at. This is a case builder. So these guys, they build their cases with twigs and sand particles. As they get larger, they abandon the old shell and build another case. Yeah, look at that, dude. He's attacking my forceps. <laughs> the Helgramites, you'll find them only in clean water systems. They're an indicator of good water quality. Now I'm here on the microscope spending hours, days, and finally enter all the data, and after that, upload it on the computer, and that's where the fun begins. Like, you know, that's the stuff I really enjoy. It took well over a year to sample and analyze the aquatic invertebrates of the Blanco. All of this information from all these species goes into one dot. So you take all these samples, so all these dots run different matrices. Then math magic happens, and what looks like flying shapes is some serious science. And uh, finally you condense all the data, and this is what you get, the product. You know, we are able to see the trends. Arch's data showed that indeed, for several weeks after the flood, aquatic invertebrate numbers were way down. Yeah, the numbers were like almost nil. But his data crunching revealed that as time went by, the aquatic invertebrates returned. The numbers come back and stabilize at a certain level at each of those sites. The whole habitat is destroyed. The flood just takes off 90% of their population and still they're able to come back and just go to stable conditions like it was before. That's just amazing. Oh, look at this. For arches. That's the damsel flag. Now he gets a chance to show off his life's passion to his kids. We go out to the river and we're swimming and all. Hey, look at that. Right now, when they're flipping those rocks, they're seeing these creatures come out live. It's just amazing. Oh, that's a Megaloptera. Guys, look, look. Actually out experiencing it. He's awesome. That's the 100% goal, is for them to be hands-on and touching. I mean, they are genuinely interested in bugs. It's great. It's great. Man, I never knew water paintings could move. 
They're so cool. So whether it's taking the kids to see them up close. It's a riffle beetle. You see that black thingy moving? Or scoping them out in the lab. Look at that riffle beetle larva. Ooh, he just turned in. Nice. <laughs> it's easy to see. Dr. Grubb's love for aquatic yep. invertebrates is pure. These organisms that we find in the water systems are really essential. We do not want sterile waters or polluted waters. That's not good for the fish, the bugs, or us humans. But what I want to do is I want to be able to leave these organisms in the river systems for my kids and their kids. I want to be able to leave the habitats in pristine conditions. Ooh, look at that. You know, not to be affected or impacted to the point where these critters are going to be knocked out of the system. So I want to do whatever I can to make a difference. We like to think of Lake Colorado City as an oasis in West Texas. There's just not a whole lot of bodies of water around here for people to enjoy. So we really are one of the main recreational draws around. Lake Colorado City State Park lies about halfway between Midland and Abilene. Built in 1949 to provide cooling water for a power plant, the lake offers a welcome contrast to the surrounding terrain. We're really kind of on the edge of the desert plains. This area at one time was a grassland prairie, but the mesquites and the prickly pear cactus have pretty much taken it over. With the dry that we have here and just a little bit of moisture, those type plants do well here. Are you ready? We're ready. ready. Don't lose your hat. <laughs> Billy Wilson regularly makes the two-hour drive from his home to Colorado City to camp and spend time on the lake. You need to have some family time. Yep. And that's what I'm doing right now. On this trip, he's breaking in a brand new boat, and he's brought his granddaughter Lexi along for the ride. I really would like to see more kids out here that are my age. It's really, really fun. Lake Colorado City State Park has a lot to offer besides the water. Hiking trails provide a great view of the rocky shoreline. The campsites are wide open. Many cabins provide many of the comforts of home. The park is very kid-friendly, with plenty of space to ride bikes or just hang out. We got wildlife, we got birds, we get probably somewhere in the neighborhood of about 300 species of birds. People love that. But the lake is the main draw here. It's what keeps families coming back time after time. You can look out from different camping sites and just see water. I like all the wildlife that's here. It's just really cool. People out here, in a drier climate, tend to enjoy the water because they don't have much of it. That's why we think of ourselves as an oasis, a place to come and enjoy the lake. My name is Steele O'Connor, and this is our family ranch. Shut It was started back in the 1870s by my great, 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 great grandfather, Thomas O'Connor. The man on the horse is Kai Bookert. He started working here when he wasn't much older than me. Mr. Kai and my grandmother have run the ranch since I was a baby after my uncle passed away. I've known him all my life. To me, he's a friend, a teacher, and part of the family. Us grandkids will someday be running things, 
but not till Mr. Kai and my grandmother say we're ready. Grab a bag of corn and uh, let's get this barrel filled up. The guy in the brown shirt is my brother Miles. Well, they nearly got all of it last night. Christian is carrying the corn and that's me in the white cap. Miles, let's get that unwrapped. We always have a list of jobs to do. Right now we're putting out bait for the feral hogs. It'll take them a few days to get used to it. The barrel is Mr. Kai's own invention. <laughs> They're really helpful because all they do is stay here. And it keeps them busy while we just sneak up. See, they'll come and knock it down, and then they'll start rooting it and see it just drop that corn. With those holes, they'll get a little tree, 15 to 20 kernels every time they roll it around. He tries to make it fun by calling the stuff we do cowboy camp. Yeah, come on in. But in reality, it's mostly hard work and a lot of learning. There you go. Now come to me and cut this bigger one. He cut the brush this way, so if the hog goes off that way, he can get a good running shot. To ranchers, these wild hogs are bad news. They root up the ground and they really tear up the, the land. It's basically just really bad. We can put the smack down on them. Yeah. Pork chop. <laughs> we started doing something, uh, Miss O'Connor and I, two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Break it off, you can always identify this plant by the smell. It's supposed to get orange. During cowboy camp, we went around to show them what it takes to uh, operate the ranches in the hunting operation. It's something you don't understand, just ask me and we'll cover it again. The immediate life threat in that sort of situation is the bleeding, because you're not going to die of the broken bone. This is one of the best plants you can have in this part of the country. It Try it. Or like some weird, like, <laughs> if you become lost outdoors as darkness nears, the first thing you should do is admit that you're lost and stay where you're at. What are they teaching these boys? It smells like lemon. The third stage is heat stroke, and that's very serious because once you get to that stage, your body is no longer sweating. That's the most important key is to communicate. If you don't talk to each other, that's when accidents can happen. Mm -hmm. We're just showing them a little bit of everything, and that's cool because this one is more excited about counting beans than the other one is more excited about the ranch, which is just what we wanted. It's got a lot of protein, like the cows like to eat this instead of the deer, and feel it's like sandpaper. Yeah, you wouldn't think they'd want to eat that, do you? Okay, y'all ready to go eat, boys? Yes, sir. There's many parts of this whole family uh, that need to be operated by a family member. Makes all the difference in the world. They make different decisions uh, than a non-family member. The ranch has gone through a lot of changes over the years. We used to have full-time cowboys and cooks, even a camp house. Cattle was king and times were good. Back in the 1870s, the ranch had over 100,000 head of cattle. but economics in the ranching industry have changed. For most ranchers, cattle is no longer a cash cow. Profit margins are close to zero, and it's a real challenge to make a ranch work financially. So, we've had to adapt. That's why a few years ago, Mr. Kai and my grandmother decided to diversify and open the ranch to hunting. In some years, it's the income we get from hunting that determines whether the ranch makes a profit or a loss. But more than that, hunting has made us look at land stewardship in a different way. Now that we're getting some rainfall, it's really starting to show up uh, with all the brushwork we did last year, the lip contract. And this ranch owner year has done outstanding work, maintaining natural ecosystems, maintaining wildlife populations, showing good stewardship for maintaining the land. Well, boys, I had told you all about uh, the duck pond that we were going to build, and we got started last week on it. Once we get it all built and flooded, then I'll come back and build some duck blinds around wherever we need them. And see, this will be big enough to where you can have two or three groups hunting on this side and a couple of groups hunting on that side and not have to worry about shooting each other. 
That truck is a little ridiculous. Look at it. I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> that's a Cummins engine. Those are straight six diesels. So that truck would outrun my truck. Steel. Steel. Nice to meet you, Jordan Kane. Christian. Christian and Miles. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Boy, y'all keep in mind that boy is 19 years old and did all that work himself and runs that big tractor. And he started running that when he was 13 years old. Okay, yeah, talented. In the beginning, Wexford Ranch was almost 1 million acres. But with each generation, the ranch has been either divided among family members or sold to pay estate taxes. We're now battling to keep the ranch intact. I noticed a few turkeys coming on in. We're trying to hold off any further land fragmentation. This is the last of the open prairie in the coastal bend. But that also means that that's a big responsibility to try to keep it together keep all the wildlife going in bigger blocks. But we're just looking at things a lot differently now. You're always changing. Uh, and I mean, they've changed for generations. Uh, if you don't, you get left behind and you're probably gonna end up losing what you have. So you better change with times. Otherwise you're just gonna get left out. And with each change, a small part of our heritage is lost. On this day, another windmill will come down, replaced with a solar or hydraulic pump. I was probably 10 years old whenever I started working on windmills, because it was my dad and uncle. Uh, and so they would stay on the ground and work the ranches, and so I would get sent up top, and I don't know, it was cool. Years ago, we had 65 windmills that uh, we would keep up with. I hate to be up there. I like it. I hate that. I like it. I don't know. Seems kind of... I'm, I'm terrified of heights, so I don't know if I'd be able to do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, boys, I think he's about ready for us to give him a hand. Don't get under it still, in case it falls. And, you know, the windmills have been the only way to go for 75 years or more. Come to me. Come to me. Yep. Now, help him pull it away from the trough. There you go. It's kind of changing at times like everything else. Uh, it's one of those deals, you know, the good old days are slowly fading away. So. I'm lucky enough to have worked for four generations. And uh, so now my bosses uh, are much younger than I, but that, that's cool too, because I put lots of responsibility on them and make them make some decisions and let them know it's not the end of the world if it's the right decision or the wrong because I've made many of both. To run a modern day ranch, you have to be smart. You have to understand a balance sheet, but most important, you have to be courageous and adapt to change. Perfect. We want it to be on here for years to come. Mr. Kai is all those things and more. It's inconceivable to think of this place without him and my grandmother. My job now is to learn as much as I can. I have a responsibility to carry on the family name and honor their legacy.